pasa? One of the problems with this crisis is that has been denied again and again, uh, was financial, but then suddenly was not only financial, became industrial, became a crisis of employment, and then became a fiscal crisis, and then a government crisis, and then a European crisis. So all this evolution of the crisis, what we in some of our papers call the metamorphosis of the crisis, and required deep analytical work in real time, and that's how uh, the aftermath network of uh, very leading intellectuals and researchers was created to meet once a year in Lisbon, do some research, uh, do a lot of thinking. I invited people who were outstanding from the intellectual point of view, people who were very independent, not paid by bankers and not paid by governments to do this work. We don't think as standard economists, and we don't think, in fact, as a standard social scientist. We think out of the box. And we try to innovate out of necessity to understand the crisis in very different terms. The era of easy credit, the era of living on debt, and enjoying the moment, the carpe diem of the economy, has ended. So this is the aftermath of carpe diem. I remember very distinctly being invited by Manuel Castells, who organized the, the network. Uh, I was visiting him in the Los Angeles area in the spring of 2009. And, you know, everybody, the stock markets were still really low, and everybody was worrying just about, you know, would I have work? Would I have a job? Can I keep up with my payments? And, and he invited me to join this group of, of people to think about this crisis. And at that time, I remember it seemed like such a relief to know that there would be a group of people to talk to and try to understand what's going on. It affected me like so many others because there were um, reductions in pension plans and savings and so forth. So there was some money or housing prices. So I own a house in the United States um, and it was worth less after the housing market went through the crisis than before. So there's that kind of personal impact. And then, of course, I made the decision to try to shift my attention to do some work on the crisis. And the crisis doesn't belong just to financial rating agencies or Goldman Sachs or big corporations, but belongs to culture and society. Only now, I believe, three to four years after the beginning of the crisis, politicians are beginning to understand that following the rules of the game that are set by the IMF and the European Union and by the Central European Bank won't be enough to solve the crisis. The medicine that they are proposing for the disease actually is even killing the patient more. Back in 2007, 2008, 
It was a crisis that seemed to take place in the city of London or in Wall Street, and it was all very strange. You know, it was very uh, people didn't understand what was going on because it was these very curious financial instruments that people had never heard of. Credit default swaps. What on earth are those? They didn't make any sense to people, but now it makes sense to people because it affects their income. It affects their jobs. It affects the conditions under which their children can get education. It affects their ability to go to a library because the library is about to be closed. It impinges directly on their lives. And now they understand what the crisis means. This is where we are today, in a very uncertain place, not in the aftermath of a crisis, but in the midst of one, where the beginning can be analyzed and documented with some precision, but where the end is not yet in sight and the outcome by no means clear. I can certainly remember walking into the center of Cambridge one day in September 2007 and seeing a long queue of people in the street wondering what exactly they were queuing for and realizing that they were queuing outside the door of Northern Rock, the bank that had previously, the night before, requested uh, a safety net from the Bank of England in terms of uh, um, backing up its precarious financial position. And it was my first witnessing of a classic bank run of people afraid that their money might be lost. So what did you feel at that moment? Some anxiety, some worry, some uncertainty about um, savings more generally, including my own. Uh, it was probably the only, uh, that I can remember, the only moment in my life when I have seriously begun to wonder whether something that I had always taken for granted, which is that when you put money in a bank, it's safe, uh, was a unreliable assumption. That is, I wondered whether, in fact, it was perhaps not safe, and that a traditional set of assumptions that we all have, which are that institutions like banks are reliable institutions that you can trust. These assumptions were called into question. The crisis has metamorphosed. What was apparently a financial crisis in 2007, 2008, a seizing up of the banking system, the credit crunch, has become a full-blown political crisis because states have become directly involved in sorting out the financial crisis and therefore the burden has been shifted onto states and governments. It's also a social crisis because in order to respond to these demands that states now face, states are dependent on private investors and they have to satisfy the conditions of private investors. In order to do that, they have to clamp down on their public spending, and they have to try to raise taxes. And this impinges directly on the lives of millions of ordinary citizens who feel that their life conditions are now being threatened. And they are responding to that with anger, with resentment, with protest, and they, one of the common refrains you hear, whether it's in Greece or Britain or Spain or Portugal, is we are being asked to pay the price for a crisis caused by others. That is, the bankers caused the crisis and we are being asked to pick up the bill, is how many people feel. <laughs> And are they right? Are they paying the bill for the banks? To some extent, they are. It is highly hypocritical to come down 
disproportionately hard on somebody who has stolen a bottle of water costing £3.50 from somebody who has lost billions of pounds. And what we want to see as community members is fair, equitable treatment. Governments and politicians are now in the front line of the crisis and they face enormous challenges. Trapped by the Faustian pact that ties their fate to private investors while at the same time facing the wrath of citizens who feel unfairly treated and betrayed. What happens on the streets of Athens and other cities may be as important in the months to come as what happens in the offices of governments and banks in New York, Washington, London, Brussels, Berlin, and elsewhere. The biggest thing right now, just to seize on it, is the worry of citizens that states are responding to global financial institutions. They are responding to investment banks. They are responding to insurance companies. They are responding to credit markets, to rating agencies like Moody's, but not to the needs of ordinary citizens. So there is a widespread distrust. The distrust of anything governments or institutions do that ha can have many different expressions. But this is at the heart of the problem. And we are finding empirically in all our analysis that that's what's going on. It's like, uh, the, yes, there is the crisis, but it's not the traditional thing. There is a crisis, and there is a crisis of social services, and there is a crisis of employment, and therefore people are uh, hit by the crisis. No, suddenly they see that all their life, when it comes into question, they don't have any instrument because they don't trust the guys that should be in charge of, protect, of protecting them, of stealing them out of the crisis, and then they are orphans at that point. And in, I think that, that element that you mentioned. At the first sight, it appears to be a global crisis all over the world. Then it is global, but not global. This is fascinating. Today, we are living in a world where Latin America, tomorrow maybe Africa, of course China and India are big centers. We are not in a, in a pure American or Euro-American hegemony. So this is one very important aspect of this crisis. What is clear and for me obvious is that many people today have the feeling that they don't know where we are going to. Personally, I don't like the idea that the system is collapsing and that we don't know what is the system, that the system is something very abstract. No, you have people, you have actors, you have bankers, you have people that live on finance, you have people that organize this financial system. So I think, I would not say that the, the system, the, an abstract system is collapsing. And the truth is it is not at all collapsing because it recovered very quickly. No, I think that we should much more try to see who are the actors. Many of us know people that work in a bank, or, but we don't have a very clear image of what, what it is. And we don't have exactly a very precise image of how these people make money. What do they want? What do they expect from life? And who are these people? How do they live? Anthropologists could tell us how these people live. It would be very interesting, how they work. What, what is their conception of life? We know very little about the dominant. And maybe this is why we call this the system. When you don't know exactly who are the actors, you give a, a very abstract and general uh, branding to what they do. So my position is that we should transform the image of a system it, into the image of actors. failure of credit, they have proposed only the lending of more money, stripped of the lure of profit by which to induce our people to follow their false leadership. They have resorted to exhortations, pleading carefully for restored confidence. They only know the rules of a generation of self-seekers. They have no vision, and when there is no vision, the people perish.